Number 10, finding out the formula for this mineral. Although they give a lot of information on, on the other minerals or the other elements like calcium, aluminium, silicon, oxygen, and hydrogen, the unknowns are aluminium and silicon. So I'll just use the aluminium and silicon together with any one convenient one to pair with. In this case, I'll use calcium. Okay. Oxygen and hydrogen, I'll just leave it aside for the time being. So, calcium, aluminium, silicon, I'll convert the number of the percentages by mass into mass. Okay, this is using the empirical formula approach. And then I divide by their relative atomic mass, AR, to find the number of moles. Once I have the number of moles, I divide by the smallest number to get the simplest ratio. So every number here will be divided by 0.351 to get the ratio. Now finally, we for every one mole of calcium, we have 1.5, 1.5 of aluminium and silicon. And then we compare back to our original number. There's two moles of calcium here. So we have to change this one to two. So we multiply by two. Uh, 1.5 becomes um, 3. So 2, 3, 3. This will be our x and this will be our y. Number 11, the students who do the past year practices seem to have problems with this question. What we have is a compound that when burnt will produce eventually 72 cubic centimeters of ca carbon dioxide. So we start off with this information because this information gives us the number of moles. So what you have to realize is okay, X will become a gas and then the gas then gives off carbon dioxide upon further reaction. So like I said, we start off with the most of carbon dioxide, 72 divided by 24,000, we get 0 0.003 moles. Now you have to understand that the number of moles of carbon dioxide is equal to the number of moles of carbon. Okay, because there's no other compound that produces carbon along the way except what was produced or what was provided by X. So if we have 0 0.003 moles of carbon dioxide in the end, it simply means we have 0 0.003 moles of carbon way in the beginning. Because carbon was not added or created along the way. So once we have this most of carbon dioxide, or uh, most of carbon in X, we find a mass multiplied by the AR. This is the mass of carbon in X in the first place. 0 0.036 grams. And then how do we find the mass of aluminium? We have the mass of carbon. This is the mass of the total. We take the difference. We have the mass of aluminium. Once we have the mass of aluminium, we find out the moles of aluminium. We divide by 27, which is the AR of aluminium. We have 0 0.004 moles of aluminium. So we have two important information, the moles of carbon inside X and the moles of aluminium inside X. And we can see that the ratio is 3 is to 4. It'll be B. Some students have suggested using AL3 plus the charges and C4 minus if there's such a thing, and then they do the cross multiplying. In this case, it does give us the answer. Okay, it just this approach might not always work, so we have to be careful of this. Number 12. Which element is likely to have electronegativity similar to aluminium? Now, electronegativity basically means how easy is it for it to lose an electron. We have to remember that along the period, as you go across the period, it's harder to lose an electron because of the increasing number of protons. So it gets harder as you go from left to right, but as you go down the group, it becomes easier to lose the electron because of the increasing number of shells. So harder as you go across, easier as you go down. So 
what actually happens is if we go diagonal okay the effects actually cancel out that's why lithium and magnesium has similar electronegativity beryllium and aluminium has similar electronegativity okay, this is what we call the diagonal effect you can actually google it for more information uh, on the internet Number 13, we have a new element. So if you look at the outer shell, seven shells in total, and the number of outer electrons will be a total of eight. So we expect this to be found in group zero together with the noble gases. Number 14, what happens when we mix the oxides of these elements with water, okay, the graph described will be B. So some knowledge that you should have is that your metallic oxides are basic. They will dissolve in water to form an alkaline solution. Aluminium and silicon, aluminium is amphoteric but importantly is it is insoluble in water. So is silicon dioxide. So when we put them in water, the pH will be 7, neutral. Here we move to the non-metallic oxides. These are the acidic oxides. So the pH will be less than 7 as we go to the non-metallic oxides. So B is the answer. Neutral, alkaline, and on this side we have acidic. Number 15, we have the first ionization energy plotted. A useful approach is the peaks here and here. If you notice, if it's first ionization energy, they belong to group 8 or group 0. And then everything else, we can fill in the other groups. If we go backwards, this will be 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, two one okay, and then group eight again so x will be group one y will be group one also number 16 why does aluminium oxide dissolve in sodium hydroxide now aluminium oxide is amphoteric when, when it reacts with an alkali, it is behaving like an acid. If the question says why does it dissolve in an acid, acidic solution, then it is actually behaving like a base in the instant. Number 17, concentrated sulfuric acid, it will react with your sodium bromide. In the first reaction, it actually donates a proton. In this case, it's acting as an acid. Okay, it loses one proton to form uh, an, and thus X and an acid. And then after that, when HBr is formed, it actually oxidizes HBr to Br2. So in the second case, it's acting as an oxidizing agent. This number 18 is a recall question. In the contact process, we have a gaseous product. The product is sulfur trioxide. This will be acidic. And the uh, catalyst used will be vanadium 5 oxide. So it's more of recall than anything. Number 19, oxidation states. I have written out on the oxidation states of each individual element in the compounds. The ones with identical oxidation states will be the hydrogen plus 1 and the chlorine plus 1 over here.
20, which one gives the same visible result with propanol and propanol, and aldehyde and uh, alcohol. If you use 2,4 DMPH, it actually only reacts with your propanol to give a yellow PPT, but doesn't react with your alcohol. So no same results. Your potassium dichromate will oxidize your propanol and also your propanol. And in both cases, we have the dichromate changing from orange to green color. Tolens or uh, sodium reacts with your alcohol to form hydrogen gas, doesn't react with your aldehyde. Tolens reagent reacts with your aldehyde, get a silver mirror, doesn't react with your alcohol. halogen alkane that will undergo an SN1 reaction that means it's giving us a clue that it's a tertiary halogen alkane right. primary will tend to go undergo SN2 secondary could be SN1 could be SN2 so we know that's a tertiary halogen alkane a yellow precipitate is indicating that the halogen involved is an iodine, an iodide. That gives us yellow, right? If it was chloride, then it would be white. So if you look down the options that we have, we look for the iodine, and then we look for the one that is a tertiary halogen alkane. This one is primary. D is a tertiary halogen alkane. which one will give 2 chloropropane in the best yield? 2 chloropropane will have the chlorine attached to the second carbon. So B and C, if you are in case you are wondering B and C there's no reaction. Sorry, B and D there's no reaction. It's between A and C. A reacting with chlorine gas with UV light is free radical substitution. The thing is we do not we cannot control where the chlorine will go and we also cannot control how many of the hydrogen will be replaced by chlorine so the yield will be um, quite uncontrollable in a way and we do not have high yield of 2 chloropropane C we have an alcohol proper 2 or and if you use SOCl2 the Cl will only be replacing the OH here. So it's very specific. We will end up with 2-chloropropane. So C will give us the best yield.